that you are here on this planet at this time for a holy purpose and that you are always in the right place at the right time right now. That's sometimes hard to remember when it's 107 outside. Like, are you sure? Because I'm sweating a lot. <laughs> um, or that you are uh, in the, having the experience of one of those viruses. You are truly where you are by divine appointment, doing the work that is yours to do by divine appointment. And we're so grateful that you have come into intersection with Unity of Mesa. Today, our speaker is Reverend Nikki Golden. She serves as co-minister here alongside me. We have Jay Melberg on the piano. We have Jackson Tyler as our vocalist. Of course, Julie Treglone is our youth ed director. And for Diversity Sunday, we have Paul Raspa. Okay, play with me, please. I mean, it's a good day. <laughs> it is a good day. Let's begin by coming into a moment of prayer, affirming that there is only one presence and one power, active in the universe and in our lives, a presence and power we call God. And as we turn our attention to and open our minds to thoughts of that divine nature. We ease into peace and we ease into joy and we remember the love that we are created to be, to express and to reach out to others with. For this moment of heaven, we say thank you, thank you, God, and amen. Announcements. Hey, we have one is a yummy, delicious announcement, and it is that we have Sunday, Sunday coming up. We do. It's sponsored by Claire Charles. She underwrote all of the ice cream, all of the deliciousness, and we're thanking her for that. Mm -hmm. But hey, <laughs> next. Sunday is a Sunday you don't want to miss because we'll be in the annex after service. Several varieties of ice cream, all the gluten-free, sugar-free, best we can, regular chocolate, vanilla, sprinkles, whipped cream, cherries, nuts, the whole mm -hmm. nine yards. I think Cassie and Buddy are doing the nuts and things. Oh, yeah, they're doing all the sprinkles. So we have the cool things like that. We have Lily's class coming up. It begins on Tuesday at, um, I'm, I'm moving just a little bit, there we go. It begins on Tuesday at 6 p.m. to 7.30. It's going over Ed, Ellen Devonport's book, The Five Principles. So we're gonna give you an overview today. These prosperity gurus. It's not just about prosperity of money. Prosperity itself means well being, and well being extends to our careers, our relationships, yes, our finances, but every aspect of our life. So come and learn her dynamic laws of prosperity and then put them in your life. Put them in your life. Mm, makes a difference. So I'm going to invite you to stand and sing as you are able. Have fun, let's rock it out. When all God's children get together, what a time, what a time, what a time, what a time. Gonna sit down on the banks of the river what a time what a time what a time that will be when all god's children sing together what a time what a time what a time what a time, what a time. all the angels in 
Good morning. I'm glad to be here with you. I'd like to have a fourth hand, please. <laughs> As Reverend Mindy said, we are each a beloved expression of God. And that's really what diversity is all about, is honoring that beloved expression that is within each one of us, the divinity that's within each one of us. And here as a community at Unity of Mesa, we want to celebrate not only each one of us, but all of the people out there, the people in our neighborhood, the people in our world, and what they believe, what they celebrate, what's important to them at the core. Because there's more that unites us and binds us than separates us. When we understand that and embrace that, we actually get closer to God we get closer to the divine that's within each one of us. And so we have a couple different celebrations that we wanna highlight this month of July. And the first comes to us from the Muslim tradition. Back in 622 CE, the prophet Muhammad had all of his followers or his key followers were in Mecca. However, Mecca wasn't liking them so much. They didn't like these folks that had a different way of thinking and a different way of praying and a different way of living. And so there was a lot of pressure for them to move on, even though this was the holy city for the Islamic people. And so uh, Muhammad arranged for his followers and he to go to Medina, but it took three months for them to relocate their lives, to truly move there, spiritually, physically, economically, to move to a much better place in Medina. Hijar, Hij, Hijra, excuse me, my daughter who speaks Arabic is going to hit me for that one. <laughs> Hijra is really that celebration that commemorates the emigration of those people from one city to another for a better life so that they could all flourish together. And so we celebrate with them. The next is from the Baha'i tradition. There was a prophet named the Bob, that's how he was referred to. And he received a download, sacred message, sacred information from God. And that information by some is considered to be as prophetic as the Torah, the Quran, the Christian scriptures as well. And in that download, which he then put into written form and shared with the people of his time, it talked about the release of the creative energies and the capacities that were necessary in order to create global peace and unity. Think about that, global peace and unity and how much we talk about that. Well, at the time, this was a little bit counter-cultural, especially for the Persians, the Muslims in Persia. And so they said, we can't deal with another prophet. We can't deal with another perspective. And so, the Bab was killed by a firing squad in 1850. His martyrdom is celebrated by the Baha'i people on July 9th. So let's go to something a little more fun. <laughs> that was heavy. Let's go to something more fun. In South Korea, there's a, a little town known as Boryong, and it's known for its mineral-rich mud. Yes, mud but it has healing properties in that mud, and it's used for all sorts of things. Well, the local folk back in about 1998 said, guess what, we'd like to bring more people to come celebrate our little town and celebrate this mud. And so they started to have a little festival. 
Well, little did they know that would take off like wildfire, and all of a sudden, thousands, tens of thousands of people decided to converge on their town every year to celebrate mud. They have a Mr. Mud contest. They have boot camps. They have mud races of all sorts and sizes. They, you can get mud facials. You can do body painting. You can do all these things with mud. And really, this time, July 19th to August 4th, is a celebration of the natural resource that's around them and how to treasure that in their lives. Our next one comes from the Latter-day Saints tradition. And on July 24th, they commemorate Pioneer Day, which was the day that Brigham Young and the early pioneers uh, moved into Salt Lake City, Utah. And so they use parades and different celebrations and reunions and devotionals and sporting events and feasts to celebrate that arrival into Salt Lake City and the start of a next journey for the Latter-day Saints people. Last of the celebrations. This comes from our Native American traditions here in the United States, particularly the Southeast United States. The Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, the Seminoles, the Timuwaku Indians. For those people, corn, yes, corn, is not only just something that they eat, but it is really the center of their life in many ways, economically, spiritually, in their celebrations. They use corn in all sorts of ways. And so as part of the harvest, they want to celebrate the fact that it is corn season. And here in late July, the different communities, based on when they're completing their harvest, will celebrate the, the Green Corn Festival, otherwise known as the Pusquita. And it's really a time for them to have gratitude for the harvest, but also a reset, a restart for new life. And they truly embrace that by doing things like having ritual fires, by cleaning the, the towns and the cities and their villages top to bottom, uh, even breaking the stuff that, like pottery that was partially worn from the last year so that they could start with new stuff this year. So this is really a time for our Native American friends to start anew, um, particularly those that rally around corn. Let's talk about a couple birthdays. First is an English writer, illustrator, a natural scientist, and a conservationist. Beatrix Potter, best known for writing the tales of Peter Rabbit back in 1902, celebrates her birthday this month. And here's a cool piece. Beatrix Potter wrote tons of children's stories, tons of children's books. 250 million copies have been sold over the years. But Peter Rabbit was the first character, the first fictional character to be turned into a stuffed toy and marketed, making Peter Rabbit the first licensed character in the United States. <laughs> so Peter Rabbit, we celebrate Beatrix Potter. Second one, uh, American film director, screenwriter, producer, uh, videographer, and photographer, Stanley Kubrick. You probably know him for 2001, A Space Odyssey. He was really credited as one of the best filmmakers of our time across all genres. He's particularly well known for his attention to detail, really just intense detail, his innovative cinematography, his extensive set design, and his dark humor. So this would be a great time, pick a time in, in July, go back and watch 2001 A Space Odyssey for those of you that are younger and haven't seen it. This might be a good time to see it for the first time. And lastly, just some fun stuff. July 1st, National Rock and Roll Day. Rock on, baby. The 10th is Kitten Day, our appreciation of cats and kittens. For those of you that are cat lovers, on the 17th, National Tattoo Day. And on the 31st, National Mutt Day. That could be dogs and cats, but I think some of us humans sometimes are a little bit mutt in our, <laughs> in our genealogy as well. So just some things to keep in mind during this month of July as we celebrate who we are as individuals, but also who are the people around us and what's important to them as well. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. I'd like to bring up Miss Kira. Come with me, stand beside me. This is Kira's first time leading our affirmation, and I'm just so thrilled that she didn't hesitate. Yep, I'll do that. So I'm going to put the microphone under your mouth, and you take it away, OK? My inner knowing guides my path. Please say it with me. Please say it with me. My inner knowing guides my path. Thank you, Kira. <laughs> Totally aced it. I love that. Thank you for the way you participate with our youth. It's fifth Sunday today, so that means we've got something special. It's all about intuition, our inner knowing. And thank you to Justine and Stephen for leading our special fifth Sunday activity today. So before we sing our children out for their class, let's say a blessing for them. Children, we love you. We bless you. We appreciate you. And we behold the Christ you are. God speaks to each of us as it makes us, then walks with us silently out into the night. These are words we dimly hear. You, sent out beyond your recall, go to the limits of your longing. Embody me. Flare up like a flame and make big shadows I can move in. Let everything happen, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. You will know it by its joy. Give me your hand. It's very odd that while I attempt to help myself, my Bible sits up on the shelf with every promise I could ever need. And the word was, and the word is, and the word will be. And the word was, and the word is, and the word will be. truth like they're buying a new tailored suit does it fade across the shoulders will it fade when it gets older we throw ideas that aren't in style in the salvation army pile and search for something more to meet our needs and the word was and the word is and the word will be It's time I rediscover all the ground that I have covered. Like, seek ye first, what a verse. We are pressed, but not crushed. Perplexed, but don't despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are no longer slaves. We are daughters and sons. And when we are weak, we are very strong. And neither death, nor life, nor present, nor future, nor depth, nor height can keep us from the love of God. And the word I need is 
the word that was, that put on flesh to dwell with us in the beginning. The word was, and the word is, and the word will be. And the word was, and the word is, and the word will be. And the word was, and the word Tyler and Jay Melberg. The new word is, the old word is, the new word is, the old word is. We're going to talk about living principles. The very first set of principles that I understand is Charles Fillmore put together. He was one of the co-founders of Unity, was 27. It wasn't long till they were down to 22. <laughs> and then his great-granddaughter, Connie Fillmore, synthesized them into five. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, is not only what those principles of unity's spiritual philosophy is, but also how do we live them. And when we live them, we know it works. Those principles work when we work them. How many of you work them? <laughs> I know you guys do. I'm messing with you a little bit. These are the five principles as Reverend Mindy and I put them forth. They're a little bit different than what's in Ellen Devonport's book, The Five Principles. The meanings are the same, but they're just spoken about a little bit differently. The first one is there's one presence. We say that as a statement of faith quite often. There's only one presence and one power active in the universe and in our lives. God, the good omnipotence. What that principle means is there's no other power. And that's the difficult thing to wrap our minds around sometimes, particularly when we look at war, particularly when we look at people who are not very kind to each other. It's very easy to say, well, there's got to be more than one power in this universe. There's got to be more than love in this universe because I'm seeing something that's unlike love right now. Have you ever had that experience? Oh, yeah. So it's hard sometimes to look at this philosophy and say, how can there be only one presence and one power when I see things that are different than that one presence and power? Hang that thought for a moment. Hang it on your, the back of your mind or over here somewhere, and we'll pick it up in a minute. The second principle is we are born in original virtue. That means that we are born in a divine nature. We are divine, and our nature is divine. Now, I grew up Southern Baptist. That is not what I was taught. <laughs> and that's nothing against the Southern Baptists. I loved my grandmother, who was my Sunday school teacher. And at some point in my life, I began to recognize that there was something more that I was looking for. Because what was... I was being taught didn't make sense to me logically, and it certainly didn't resonate in my heart. I often asked the question and got in a lot of trouble for it. What did I ever do that was so wrong that some man had to die on the cross for my sins? It just didn't make sense to me. And I quite often got in trouble for it, and I continued to ask it, but I learned to ask it inwardly versus outwardly. What did I do? And then the break came when I was in junior high school, and my absolute best friend was growing up Catholic. She was born in a family that had generations of going to the Catholic church. She was born in South Louisiana, and if you know much about the Cajun history and culture, she was born into a Catholic family. And 
she would come to Sunday night service with me sometimes at the Baptist church, and I would go to Sunday afternoon service with her sometimes. It was a folk mass. It was a lot more fun than our services were. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And I didn't get in trouble for sort of dancing to the music. You know how music comes on and your body just wants to move to it? Well, that's what would happen when I was singing in the youth choir in the Baptist church. And then somebody would come along and say, don't you know that Southern Baptists don't dance? It was like, I, didn't even, I wasn't even aware that I was mu moving to the music. So what we're beginning to see is some differences, correct? We're beginning to see some differences. Those differences are not bad. It, the real question is, what do we resonate with? And if you resonate with how the Southern Baptists or the Methodists or anybody else do things, that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. You might be a little bit uncomfortable here at times. And you're still welcome with all your beliefs, whatever your belief is. Because we believe that we are born divine. And thus from our divinity, we are all on a spiritual path. We're on a spiritual path of waking up to who we are. We're on a spiritual path to discovering our magnificence. We're on a spiritual path to knowing the truth that love is and love wins and love is what we're made of and that when we move out of the sense of being loving that we're going to be uncomfortable. Have you ever been mad and then mad at yourself that you're mad because you don't want to be mad so now you're double mad? <laughs> it happens, right? Because we're having some feelings but I don't want these feelings because these feelings are not the truth of me. Well, they are a part of me, yes. It's my experience in this moment, whether that's mad, sad, glad, joy. Those experiences are the experience of the moment. But when we're in some of those experiences, we become uncomfortable because they're not the razor-sharp truth of who we are. And who we are is divine. Who we are is divine in nature. And so our whole desire of our hearts and minds is to express that divinity as best we can in any given moment. The third unity principle is that we are mindful creators. Now you're going to see this some places, mindful co-creators. But if we are truly living in oneness with God, we can't be a co-creator because that would create duality. And we live in a world in the relative world that seeks to push us into duality anyway. It's day and night, it's black and white, it's hot and cold. Get it? Yeah. And if you're out at night and you're saying, wow, this is beautiful daylight, you might be in a certain part of the country where that is true, but somebody's gonna tell you, no, it's nighttime. Because <laughs> we're so ingrained in our dualistic thinking but just because we're so ingrained in our dualistic thinking doesn't make it the truth of us. The truth of us is that we're divine in nature and that we have the freedom to express as much of our God self or whatever your name for God is, as much as that God self as we can in any given moment. So the human part of us is not wrong. The human part, we're here having, we're being human, we're having this human experience and I think that we're here to have a lot of fun with it personally and to figure out who we are. And then when we're living from our heart and our solar plexus and we're living from our root chakra and we're living from our crown chakra and all the chakras in between, that we're going to be, and they're wide open, we're going to be having a lot more fun with it. And we're also learning to understand the principle of the mind, mind, Thank you, I'm having trouble with that idea word. Mind, idea, expression. When we're learning how to live with that, when we're learning how to recognize our thoughts create the experience of our reality, then we can recognize, oh, this thought that I'm thinking is creating this experience that I'm not wanting to be happening, happening at this moment. So what might I do? I can shift the thought to have a different experience of reality. There were a lot of psychic experience, uh, experiments in the 60s where there would be a classroom of 200, 250 people in an introduction to psychology lecture hall. These happened in those classes a lot because the students had to 
usually we're required to have a certain amount of experimental credits to be a subject. So they would use these classrooms quite often and here would burst somebody in and they would have something to say and they would be disruptive in this classroom when the professor was trying to talk and then they would exit. They would exit some way. And then the class would stop and the professor would begin to process and what was happening is they were looking at perception, people's perceptions of what happened. So 250 people, how many perceptions do you think there were? <laughs> Close to 250. Did he have a gun? Did he not have a gun? You know, did he come in the left door? Did he come out the right door? Did he come in the same door and leave the same? There were all these things. What was he wearing? There were all of these things. And what they discovered over and over is that we see the world through the filters that we carry. I talked about this a little bit last week when we talked about seeing it rightly. We see the world through the filters that we carry. So when we have on filters, when we're wearing filters of love, we're going to see the world differently than when we have on our angry filters or our sad filters. Have you ever been to Costco? I'm going to pick on Costco, not Walmart this week. Have you ever been to Costco when you're tired and when you're hungry? And you look through, what was that? And you look through Costco and you're walking around and you're thinking, wow, people look really tired in here. Not recognizing that it's really us. It's really us. And so we're mindful creators and what we think about, we bring about. We are the thinker that thinks the thought that creates the experience of the thing. That's Johnny Coleman, and I kind of tweaked her a little bit. We are the thinker. So how simple in many ways that all we need to do is shift our thinking, shift our perspective. But have you ever had trouble doing that? I have had some difficult times, particularly when I'm caught up in something. That's when we move to prayer and meditation. Now, let me tell you, when I'm anxious, meditation is not going to be the sit down, put my legs in crisscross applesauce and just be because the chair would be vibrating with all of that anxious energy. But what it can be is I can clean my shower. I can move. I can take a walk. I can put music on and dance. I can move the energy because remember, our feelings are simply a sine wave of energy. They're a frequency of energy that's moving through us and no, there's not an, an, a feeling that's a bad or a good feeling. It's just a feeling. It's an energy, a frequency that's moving through us. And what that frequency is doing is giving us some information about where we are and who we are. I had an experience a couple weeks ago with somebody who did something that I didn't like. I just didn't like it. And I noticed I didn't like it, so I noticed that my jaw got tight. I noticed my shoulders came up toward my ears. And I was thinking, oh, I'm mad. And again, I didn't want to be mad, and I was mad. And I thought, what have I been practicing? What have I been learning? It took me a few beats to get there. And I came back to my heart space and I breathed. And I breathed. And I breathed. And I started to create stories. And this is a game that Reverend Mindy and I like to play together. What other story might I make up than this person was disrespecting me? You know, that was my first story. This person's disrespecting me. That was my first story. But when I was able to come back to my heart and take a breath, touch your heart for a moment, and just take a breath. Now think about somebody that you struggled with this week or some moment that it might even not, not even be a person. It could be an event that you've had a challenge with this week. And take a breath into it and say, what can I learn from this? What can I learn from this? And so I asked that question in the moment of my anger. What can I learn from this? And what other story might I tell myself? Well, I can make up about 50 stories. They were all different. Because I've been playing this game with Reverend Mindy for a long time, so I could come up with different stories. And at some point, one of the stories made me laugh. And the moment I laughed, the anger dissipated. 
And I could see this individual with a different set of lens because I was no longer angry. That's a powerful creation of who we are and how we can express living the principles of our divine nature. We can make a shift. We can simply make a shift. And breathing is a great way to do it. Many of us breathe up here in the thoracic region. I'm talking about breathing down here. And I know, I know women. We are taught to hold our bellies in. And at the same time, when we hold our bellies in, we actually break down those muscles. So breathing into the belly and then breathing out from the belly and breathing into the belly in the diaphragm helps to oxygenate our lungs, helps us to have more vitality, helps us to experience greater joy. And all of that is a form of meditation. In unity, so I did meditation and prayer a little bit backwards. In unity, one of our principles is to come to prayer and we do affirmative prayer. I am a beloved expression of God. Say that with me. I am a beloved expression of God. I am prosperous. Say that with me. I am prosperous. I live in joy. I have a great time in life. I know who I am, I know who who you are, are. and I express it. it. Amen. We've prayed together. We've prayed together affirmatively. We say affirmations, as Eric Butterworth teaches, not to make them true. We say them because they are the truth of us. Prosperity is our divine birthright. Joy is our divine birthright. Do we have other feelings than joy? Yes. Sometimes there are things like love, harmony, peace. All of those are beautiful. And sometimes we feel angry and sad and hurt. And all of those are actually quite beautiful too because there's a lesson in each of the feelings for us. There's something that's calling us to be greater than we are in this moment. Have you ever had that experience? Whether we're sad and we're missing someone or something that's been in our lives, that can call us to a greater awareness of the joy and the love that we had around that person. It can remind us that the pain honors the love that still exists. It's just in a different form. And it can call us to recognizing, I have loved in this manner that I'm missing this person or this thing or this event or this place, and I can recreate this love in a new way, in a way that serves me in this moment. Our brains do not know the difference between reality as we think about it and our imagination, and our imagination is one of the powers So when we sit in meditation, when we sit in prayer, and we remember with love from our hearts that individual, that place, that thing, then we're able to have that experience all over again. Is it the same as having the physical person? No, sometimes it's better, depending on who the person is in our lives. And yet, we can still have it. When we first moved out of Hawaii, One of the things I used to do was lead a Wednesday night meditation group. And I would inevitably be missing Honolulu and my life there. I hadn't been in Connecticut very long. And it dawned on me, well, I have an imagination. So in that meditation, I would go back to standing on the beach, my absolute favorite beach. See, I even close my eyes when I do it because it brings that image to me. I would go back to standing on that beach. I could smell the fragrance in the air. I could feel the soft touch of the wind. I could feel the warmth of the sand. I made it as vivid as I possibly could. And it was as if I were there. I will say I never came back sunburned. (laughs) I haven't had that experience yet. But I could be there. I could feel it. And the longing to be in a place other than where I was began to dissipate. And as soon as that longing began to dissipate, I could open my eyes to what I had in front of me, 
the love and the joy that I had been missing because I was so busy seeing something else. I was so busy wishing for the past. This is, these are ways that our principles support us. One presence, original virtue, mindful creation, prayer and meditation. These are all about beingness. I'm going to say that again. I really want you to get this. These first four principles are about our way of being in the world. And then we can step into action. When we get in alignment with one presence, with our own natural divinity, when we come into recognizing, owning, and embracing that we are creators of the experience of our universe, when we come into prayer and meditation, whether it's walking the dog, meditating, playing the piano, meditating, whatever way in which you do that, then we're coming into our beingness in our divine nature, and then we can take the action. And what kind of actions might you take? Oh, I skipped a whole section. I'm going to go ahead and skip it. Am I affirming divine intelligence and love in this situation? This is how to put living the principles into action. Am I, this divine being that I am, having a conversation with you, this divine being that you are, and am I affirming the divine intelligence and love that's moving between us, that's within each of us? The moment that I got mad, I wasn't there. And the moment I came back to my heart, I began to be there. And the moment I breathed and could begin to release the grip of that persona that says, you're disrespecting me, I was able to begin to affirm the divine intelligence and then to move to wonder, I wonder what's going to happen in this situation. Am I affirming divine intelligence and love in this situation? When I could answer that question, yes, then my anger easily dissipated. It's a strategy to navigate feelings. There's nothing wrong with feelings. They're not positive, negative. They're not good and bad. We bring that duality. They're simply an energy that is moving through us. Another question that we can ask ourselves, do I remember my divinity and that of others involved? When I'm having a conversation and the love is flowing. It's so easy to think, oh, you're divine in nature. When I get on the freeway and somebody does something I think is crazy, it's a little bit more difficult for me. But I can come back and make a choice because this is where we have the freedom, the freedom to choose. I choose to see you as divine. I choose to see this situation, whatever it is, as having good within it because I know and affirm that there is only one presence and one power that's active in the universe. Am I willing to make that choice? And am I willing to take as long as it takes for me to make it? And then the next time, maybe it's going to take a little less time. And the next time, a little less time. And I'm going to close the gap. Before I make a decision about something, before I open my mouth, can I spend time in prayer and meditation receiving divine guidance before I take action? Sometimes we don't have the moments to do that, or we think we don't, but when we can just touch our hearts, we're opening our hearts. So just for a moment, think of a decision you made this past week and touch your heart and take a breath into that. It helps us to remember who we are. It helps us to open our hearts to that decision. Otherwise, we're making the decision strictly from our intellect versus from our intellect, our inner knowingness, our head and our heart together. Have I spent time in prayer and meditation? It, it can take a long time for big decisions, and it can take a short time for short decisions. I had a flat tire yesterday. The question is, what good is going to come out of this? It was not in my intended experience of the day. And yet, let me tell you the good that came out of that. The tire was completely flat. I took the time 
to take care of it. it. I was in and out in less than an hour because the way that things unfolded, I had gone into the tire place thinking, well, if I go in, it'll, it'll be shorter. They sent me to where you get your air checked. And that young man said, oh, I, I think you might have a hole in your tire and it com looks completely flat. And so go right into the bay. <laughs> wow, that's right. Go right into the bay. So I drove the car right into the bay. And they looked at it, and the guy said, oh, yeah, you definitely. I mean, I could see the, the bubble stuff just floating. And I could look at the tire and see that it was flat. So I went in. I purchased a new tire. We had a conversation, because I like to ask questions. We had a conversation. And that, that car, my beautiful, I call her Miss Aloha, was looked at immediately. 15 minutes later, I'm driving out of there. I'm, that's the good. That's the good that came out of an experience that could have taken me hours because you know how they have these apps right now. The app said 3.30. And I said, is it really going to be 3.30? He said, nah, look at your car. The wheel was already off. There was a new tire being put on. I was out of there in 15 minutes. Good came out of that. I wasn't upset. I asked the question, I wonder what good is going to come out of this. I was appreciative. I was thoughtful. When we are behaving, and I don't, I'm not trying to point my fingers at you, but when our behavior, when our actions are in alignment with our nature, things unfold beautifully. And when we live these principles, our life unfolds beautifully. Will there be hiccups? Yes. Will there be bumps in the road? Yes. Will there be flat? tires at times. Yes. We live in Arizona. What can I say? <laughs> that was what he said. You live in Arizona. These things happen. Life happens. But what's beautiful is we have these spiritual principles and we have these spiritual tools to support us in moving through whatever is happening and to do so with joy. And if we have a few hiccups of emotion on the way, we can celebrate that. Yay, I felt betrayed by my tire and I felt angry. Yay, I felt disrespected by a person and I felt angry. I am feeling. And so often we're taught to put our feelings away. But I am feeling. And all feelings come out of the same faucet. So if we begin to put our anger away and pretend it's not a part of us, then we're going to have a hard time. If we put our sadness away and pretend I'm not sad and I put on a happy face when you see me and I say, oh, I'm great, how are you? <laughs> then eventually I'm going to have so much stuff energetically dense in my body that things are going to begin to break down. So what I want to do is find healthy, happy, fun, exciting ways to express all of the different feelings so that when I have appreciation, when I have love, I can express it as fully as I can with anger or sadness or grief. The difficulty has been that most of us haven't been taught how to express anger or sadness and grief. And we'll, we'll begin to do that in here soon. I promise you that. But what I can tell you right now is if you're willing in any feeling to come to your heart and to breathe into your belly and focus on your breath and slow your breath down a little bit, then the parasympathetic nerve kicks in and the parts of our body, the endorphins and the polypeptides that support us in well-being will begin to come through. We just have to remember. And we may start as, <gasps> but we'll end if we stay with it as, ah. Oh. It's the way it works. It's part of how the law works. So what can we do? Seek to see the best in everyone. Seek to see the divine in everyone. Call forth the good in all situations. 
I called forth the good in our tire situation, and it was unresolved so beautifully, and I was so grateful. Support each other in love. We are here for you. You are here for each other. How do we be love? Share stories of love. Focus on love. Focus on joy that's happened. Tell each other when you go to um, hospitality, what was the best part of your week? Let me tell you about the best part of my week. Let me tell you about something that happened that was joyful. Let me share something that was difficult that I worked through easily. Let me share something that's difficult for me. Can you hold me in prayer? See how we can support each other as a spiritual community and live in the high vibration of joy as much as you can. Make that choice. And when things don't feel joyful over here, like take the smallest action step. Abraham Hicks talks about it as climbing the ladder of a better feeling thought. So have a better feeling thought. So when I get frustrated with something, what's a better feeling thought? Oh, I'm so appreciative of my relationship. I'm so appreciative of my work. I'm so appreciative of the friendships that I have developed. I'm so appreciative of having enough in my life that I feel like I can have fun. I'm so appreciative of my self-love. Better feeling thoughts. Climb the ladder. We don't have to go from zero to 60. We just simply climb the ladder. Charles Fillmore says, pronounce every experience good and of God. Sometimes that's hard to do. But when we're willing to do it, it works when we work it. Pronounce every experience good and of God. And by that mental attitude, you will call forth only the good. We have to practice. And we have to practice, and we have to practice, and we have to practice, and we have to practice. And I don't know how old you are. I know how old I am. I got that many years of doing it differently. So I got to practice, 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 practice. So if you do it on something you love, you're going to call forth even more good. So you could practice it on the easy things first and then practice it on the not so easy things. What seemed error, what seems error will disappear and only the good will remain. This is the law. This is the law of mind action he's talking about. And no one can break it. Let's say this together. Pronounce every experience good and of God. And by that mental attitude, you will call forth only the good. What seemed error will disappear and only the good will remain. This is the law. No one can break it. So think for a moment about something that you have been challenged by. And just say out loud, I call forth the good. I call forth the good. I call forth the good. We don't always see things in their full perspective. Because we see things as we are. This is an invitation for us to open up our sight, to see a little bit differently, to look at things a little bit differently, and to shift our mental attitudes so that what we see is calling forth the good. Pronounce every experience as good. I'm going to ask you to say one more thing with me. I am a beloved expression of God. This is the truth of us. This is the truth of you. This is the truth of me. Even in those moments that we feel like we're not whole, and I know we all have them, they're feelings. They're not the truth of us. The truth of us is that we are a beloved expression of God. The question is, how much of that expression are we giving in the world? To ourselves first, and then in the world. Let it be. Let it be the full expression of you. We're going to sing our way into meditation. Love, serve, and remember as an affirmation of who and what we are in this and every moment of our lives. Mm -hmm.
meditation let's say quietly together I am a beloved expression of God I am you are a beloved expression of God no matter how you've seen yourself in the past no matter what you think you've done no matter what someone else has said to you about who you are, remember, you are here to love. And the moment we begin to truly love, the moment we begin to live in that energy of love, then we begin to serve. We serve without even thinking about it. We serve by being the love that we are, by being the light of the world that we are. We serve each moment that we remember who we are. And even in the midst of sadness or anger or guilt or grief or hurt, remembering that we are a beloved expression of God, remembering who and what we are, remembering, remembering that we are born divine in nature, that we are mindful creators, remembering that there is only one presence and one power active in the universe and in our lives, God the good, omnipotence, and that we are one with that universal intelligence. We take these thoughts, these ways of being into meditation to support our beingness into the sacred and holy silence. to hear that yet again. You are a beloved expression of God. You are divine in nature. You are a beloved expression of God. As we begin to come back to this room, to this time and this place, let's begin by saying that, affirming that truth 
that absolute truth of who we are. I am a beloved expression of God. Say it with me. I am a beloved expression of God. And turn to somebody near you and say, you are a beloved expression of God. You are a beloved expression of God. It's the truth of us. It's something to celebrate. It's something to remember. And it's a way that we can stand in the living of the principles. Have a great time doing it this week. Thank you, Reverend. Nikki, for that reminder of those principles and the invitation to learn about it further coming up on Tuesday night. Uh, we thank you all for sharing your prosperity with Unity of Mesa and also appreciate your financial donations to keep our community going. Thank you for uh, the offertory assistance today. There are several ways to give, five as a matter of fact, to Unity of Mesa. Up here on the uh, screen you can see, you can donate online, a Venco app. You can text it and the phone number's there via the mail and in person like we can do today. So thank you for that. Uh, let's say together, our love through me as me, blessed and multiplies all that I have, all that I live, all that I receive. And so it is.
I don't think I was the only one who wanted to dance. <laughs> As our beautiful ushers have come forward, let's bless your generosity, your expressions of generosity together by saying, we are one with the opulence of God. We are now in the flow of infinite abundance, and we give thanks for the prosperity that is ours by divine right. What a great Sunday. What a great day. So grateful for your presence, for your willingness to embody unity principle and experience more of the beloved expression that you are. We have hospitality in the community room. The bookstore is open. And we have prayer chaplains. We have chaplains available to hold you in prayer when you go, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm having a lot of trouble putting my hand on my heart. <laughs> okay, we've got John. We've got Barbara. We've got Jim. Jim. Yay, Jim and Audrey. Okay. Lots of support for you in this spiritual community. So grateful for your presence today. Thank you for who you are. Who you are not only in this room, but who you are when you spread out into your lives, shining the light that you are, being the beloved expression of God. You make a difference. You know that. You make a difference. Keep having fun while you're making that difference. And maybe dance a little on the way out. Ready? Yes. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Oh, oh, oh. I can see all obstacles in my way. Oh, oh, oh. gone are the dark clouds that hide me down. It's gonna be a bright, bright. Shiny day, it's gonna be a bright, bright. 